So I've started recording. Um, at the end, uh, if you want to ask questions, then um, you can just type them in in the um, in the chat window. So we have about 16 people in. So I'll just wait, I'll probably wait till about five past for just a couple of minutes to start. Um, So what I'm going to have to do, I'm going to halfway through the session, I'm going to switch between uh, a presentation and a, a, an online session uh, where I'm actually uh, using um, Archer. So what I'll do is I'll actually just try and, I'm going to start in a minute or so, but I'll just check that that switching works just now so we don't have any problems later on. Um, so it should be tools, application sharing, stop sharing, tools, application sharing okay so that looks yeah does that look readable that's big enough isn't it just about okay Okay, so I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to this virtual tutorial. I said there's about uh, 15 or 16 people in the room, which is good. Um, I'll uh, I'll start off as that there's going to be a few slides, maybe half a dozen slides, uh, setting the scene. Then I'll switch to um, a live session where I've got a, a window on Archer, and I'll try and ex um, explain some of the issues with with a, with a real session. Um, it may not go 100% smoothly because I haven't. This is new. This hasn't uh, been run before, but uh, hopefully it'll, it'll be useful to you. So first of all, so uh, I also had I had hoped to put all the material up online in advance, but unfortunately due to the technical problems I've had, I've not been able to do that. But I will put it up after the event. So if you go back to the virtual tutorial page, after maybe. Tomorrow, all the material will be up there because I have some programs and things that I want to show. So, uh, making compilation. Um, I ran an introductory course last week, an introduction to uh, high performance computing. And one of the things that people said is that they wanted to hear a bit more about um, compilation and make. Many people had only ever worked with small programs or they'd only ever compiled things by hand and not used make files. So, I was going to cover a few basic issues here. So all this material is, is available under the standard Archer license where you can reuse it for, um, for non-commercial use. Okay. So first of all, just to set the scene, um, compiling a simple code might be easy. You can do ccprogram.c to get a dot out, or you might be a bit more adventurous and do cc-o program.exe program.c. But in fact, all but the simplest programs have more than one source file. So what you could do is every time you want to compile your program, you do cc-o program.exe and all the files, file one, file two, file three dot c. But of course, this is wasteful. What you're doing is you're recompiling every um, every source file every time, and you may only have changed one. So what we tend to do 
and you can do this by hand, of course, is to compile independently. So rather than just producing the program file from the input files, you compile each program independently. So CC minus C does that, and that produces the .o file, an object file. So for each C file, you have an object file, and at the end, when you do CC minus O program.exe, you don't specify the .c files, you specify the .o files. So all the, all the, the compiler is actually doing there is linking. It's just linking these files together, but individually they've already been compiled. So that's what you want to do. But there's an obvious problem. What happens if I change file 2.c? So I do cc minus cc file 2.c to recompile file 2.c and then reading all the object files. But of course, this is incredibly error prone. Possibly I changed more than just file 2.c. Maybe I forgot I changed file 3 and forgot about it. And if I've changed file 3 and I haven't recompiled it, then my program.exe won't reflect the, um, the changes in file 3. So let's be safe. Let's just remove everything and recompile. Well, that's wasteful. Okay? So only if you do things by hand, one option is to only recompile the files that you've changed, but that's very error prone because it's not obvious which files you've changed. It's very easy to change a file and not, and not remember you've changed it. Or you can recompile every time and that's wasteful in terms of your time and computer time. So there are even more problems. This is where the complexities really come in. It's when source files often depend on others. So for example, if you have include files, which you often have in, um, in C programs, in Fortran we maybe have modules and I'll come back to modules later um, very briefly. Um, how do I know which files to recompile? So as I said, re recompiling all files is slow and unnecessary, but actually failing to recompile, recompile a file is disastrous. The, there's nothing more difficult to debug than when the executable you're running doesn't reflect the current state of your program. So you run the executable, it produces an error, you look at the source code, and you're not looking at the same source code that was compiled. That, I mean, I've had that situation, and it is you just get completely lost. You end up completely lost. So what we want is, just with this brief backdrop, we want a tool which remembers the dependencies between the files. So you want to be able to say when you create a new file like include 3.h, you need to be able to say, well, actually, this it, this is included in file 3.c and file 4.c. So if I change include 3.h, I need to recompile file 3 and file 4. You also want that to be in a human readable form because you don't want to put that all information in and for it to be stored away invisibly. Um, if it's human readable, somebody else can come in and not just look at your source code, but look at this record of how the files depend on each other, which gives them extra information. So you want to be able to be able to have a tool which remembers the dependencies between the files, but also that's human readable. And then you want the tool to recompile all files that need to be updated, and that's essential. Otherwise, you end up with a program which doesn't reflect your source code, and it's impossible to work with it. But you also want a tool which recompiles the minimum number of files. So those are the three things we want to, we want to um, achieve. The first aim there may not be an obvious one, but as I said, if you write down how the files depend on each other, then it gives you a lot more information about the code. Okay? It, for example, if somebody wants to change some parameter by looking at the dependencies, it might be obvious where that information is stored. So the dependencies are kind of meta information about the way your program is structured, which is also valuable to document. So enter make. So this is where make comes in. Make is a tool, and you do the following things. Now I should, before I carry on, I should say that what I'm t talking about make here is, is what I understand from being a user of make. Um, if I get something wrong or I've technically made a mistake, please point it out. I can't guarantee you that all this material is 100% correct, but it's my working knowledge of make, having used it for, for many years. So the first thing a user does is you specify pairwise dependencies between files. It's very important. Make you take pairs of files and you say that they depend on each other. So you might say program 2.0 depends on program 2.c. That means that program 2.0 is produced from program 2.c. And therefore, by inference, if program 2.c is changed, program 2.0 needs to be uh, recreated. Or you might say program 2.c depends on include 3.h. Maybe the first line is hash include, include 3.h. That means that if include 3.h is changed, program 2.c um, is, is altered, and therefore program 2.0 needs to be recreated. Now, you've seen there's a double dependency there, actually. Um, I've said that program 2.0 depends on program 2.c, and that program 2.c depends on include 3.h. I've only specified pairwise dependencies. But importantly, the make tool works out the entire dependency tree. 
So you only have to specify pairwise dependencies. Make will go away and figure out the chain and rebuild things and, 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 and do things in the right order. So that's the first, the first step of using the make tool. To, we'll use it to describe how to compile a program, but my examples will be actually not program based. They'll be, they'll be based on another example of a family tree. The user then specifies pairwise rules for resolving dependencies. So I've said that program 2.0 depends on program 2.c, which means if program 2.c is altered, program 2.0 needs to be recreated. But how do you create it? I have to tell the tool to update program 2.0, you run the compiler on program 2.c. So these are the two stages in, in, in using make. You specify how files depend on each other in a pairwise manner. And then in a pairwise manner, you specify how to generate a file from another file. And all this information is stored in a make file. So the previous stuff tells make when to update a file, but you also have to tell it how to update it. So you tell make how to update the file in this, and all this information is stored in a make file. So using the make tool, the art of using make is to write a make file which encapsulates the, the, um, the characteristics of your multi-file program, how files depend on each other, and how to create files from each other. So how does make know when to update? Okay. Well, the important point is make compares the date stamps of files. So what make does is when it looks at your files, if you say program 2.0 depends on program 2.c, it will look at the date stamps when they were last modified. And if program 2.c was modified more recently than program 2.0, it knows it has to re recreate program 2.0, and it will find the rule for recreating program 2.0 from your make file. So it's important. So I think there's three important points there. To use make, or well, there's four points. To use make, you write a make file. The make file contains A, pairwise dependencies between files, and B, rules for creating files from other files. And the fourth basic point is that make looks at the date stamps of files as a way of deciding, or the way of deciding, whether something needs to be updated or not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a small example. And I didn't want to use a programming example. I think that by using the programming example, make it a general tool for, for, for resolving dependencies between files. And in fact, they could be, you might have a document which includes a, um, a graph. And so when you recreate the graph, you need to recreate the document and then re maybe write out a PDF. So you have some dependency between the output PDF, the document, and your input graph. So make could be used in all these, in all these, um, um, these situations. So I didn't want to jump straight into programming. I wanted to take a step back and do a more abstract example. So the one I came up with is, and I'll, we'll see how well this works, is I'm going to do a sort of family tree. So there are three types of files. I'm, I'm talking about myself. There's me, which I'll call david.self, a parent david.parent, and a child david.child. And this is kind of asexual reproduction, so I only have one parent, and uh, I, I produce a child, but well, that's put to one side. The important point is the self is younger than parent, and child is younger than self. So those are input files, and we're going to specify dependencies between them to tell make that, that that self should be younger than parent, and that child is younger than self. And then we're going to have to say what to do with those files if those, if those uh, dependencies aren't reflected in the date stamps of the files. To make it a bit more realistic and to kind of look forward to when we're doing um, programming examples, I'm going to have one final output file. David family is going to contain the date ordered listing of the source files. So if it's correct, David family should, should contain the files listed in the order parent, self, and child. And so I've said what the dependencies are. If I, if I dis discover that David.self is younger than David.child, how do I update child? Well, I copy. I copy David's self to David.child. This is my, uh, my reproduction rule. But that means that the child is now younger than, than, than me because the child file has just been created. So I'm going to, the update rule is just a copy. And I'll give you the update rule for the, for the family. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and uh, switch to my live demo. OK, so here I am in family one. And I will just basically do a bit of bookkeeping. OK, so 
if you look at it, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to list the. I wonder if that does that help. Does, is that could someone type in? Is that is that legible on your screen? I can make the font bigger if required. Um, could, if, is it re, okay? Fine. So um, okay, that's good. So what I'm going to do, if you look, I'm, at the moment you'll see that self, child, and, and okay, we've got something in the wrong order here actually. Uh, so I, I, ls minus lrt lists the files in reverse order. So you'll see that David dot self is the youngest, then child is. Uh, sorry, David.self is the oldest, then the child, then the parent. So this is actually in the wrong order. But what I want to do is to show you the make file. So the important point is how do we encapsulate the um, the rules we just talked about in the make file? And um, I don't know if the, the font, I don't like the blue font in Emacs, but hopefully that's legible. Um, is, is the blue OK? I don't know if I can turn that off. I, font, yeah, I've, Emacs is doing some kind of annoying... Uh, Syntax highlighting. So, this is a very basic make file. What I say is that I, I say that David dot child depends on David dot self. So this, this file one colon file two means that the former, the first one depends on the second. So the child depends on uh, on 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 myself, which means the child should be younger than myself. And therefore, the update rule is copy David dot self David dot child. So this is two lines in make. The first, yes, yeah, someone say not that good. Does anyone know how to turn off font highlighting? Escape X font lock mode return. Escape X. Right, brilliant. Uh, Mark, thank you very much. Okay, so now I. Um, so, and the same thing for the for the um, for the dependencies of 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 myself on my parent. I depend on my parent because I'm produced from my parent. If that, so that's that's the rule a colon b. That's saying that David dot self depends on David dot parent. And then if that is not true, the next line tells you what to do to um, to resolve that. And I said I'm just using a simple copy rule. The final one is this might seem slightly weird, but um, I am. I am, oh, yeah, so uh, Harvey's just, I, I come back, there's a subtlety with this file which I'll come back to later. Um, David family depends on, I, if I want the whole family to be up to date, David family depends on David self and David child. And what it's saying is, is that if those have changed, then I need to recreate David family. And I've got this strange rule for using recreating David family. All I'm doing is I'm re and listing ls minus lrt David dot star eight to Z says says list all the David dot files in uh, in date order with um, youngest fir uh, sorry oldest first and create David family that redirects David family so maybe it'd be more obvious if I if I show you what to do so if I type make David dot um, dot child okay. I think nothing will happen because the child, my child, is already younger than myself, uh, and it didn't do that. So it did copy David dot parent. Okay, I, okay. So I was trying to be too complicated. Um, what I should do is I will. I've now got an up to date. I've got an up to date system here. So what I'm going to do is you'll see they're not, they're currently in the correct order. David dot parent, David dot self, David dot child. What I will do is update David dot parent. I'm just going to edit it and resave it, okay? So when I do the ls and I'm now you see David dot parent is, um, um, is 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 younger than um, than David dot self. So what I meant to do was make David dot self. Sorry, it's right. So what it notices, I told it to make David dot self, which says, could you please update David dot self? It noticed that David dot self was actually um, older than David dot parent, and it recreated. David.self by copying David.parent to David.self. And the important point is if I do it again, it will say David.self is up to date. Okay? What I meant to do there was if I now make the parent a bit younger again, they're now in the wrong order. We have child self parent, which is exactly the wrong way around. If I now do make David.child, which is what I did at the 
I haven't specified how child depends on parent. I've just specified that the child depends on myself and I depend on my parent. But make understands that tree. So it looks at make David dot child and it unwinds it all. And so it knows that the first thing it has to do is to, to, to make the child, it first has to make me and then make the child. So this is the clever point about make. I never explicitly anywhere said that the child depends on the parent or how the child depends on the parent. It was implicit. I said that the child depended on me and I depended on my parent. And therefore it then, uh, it then recreates, uh, recreates the file. And if I do make david.child again, it will now say it's up to date. So I, what I keep doing is, e is editing the parent file to make it as young as possible. So that's, um, that's all I'm doing there. And if I, if I actually look at the make file again, the output I really want is David's family which is a listing of all the files. So if I now do make David family, what it will do is it should update all the individual files to be up to date and then create the family. So you'll see what it did. It did the two updates rules before. It copied david.parent to david.self. It copied david.self to david.child and then, then listed all the files and put them to David family. If I look at David family, that should create, um, that, that, that uh, includes all the, the um, parent, self, child in the correct order. The date resolution isn't accurate enough um, to see it here. Uh, they're all given as 1522, but, but they are in the right order. The final thing that may not be obvious is if I remove that file, David Family, and I do make David Family again, it will recreate it, but it doesn't need to update any of the individual files. So it notices, look, I need to recreate David Family because it's not there anymore, but actually the, the, the files themselves, parent, self, and child were already in the correct um, correct date order. So hopefully that was, that was useful. So I'll just pre briefly go back to make file again. We have these, these dependencies that says the child depends on, 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 on me. And I, if, if that isn't respected, I have to create the child from me. But I depend on my parents. And if that hasn't respected, I have to create me from my parent. And a slightly strange rule at the end saying that David family, which is going to play the role really of the executable file in the end, depends on all of them. Well, not explicitly on David.parent. And then I, I list, I've just did something arbitrary and I've listed them create to create that file. So now I'm going to go back to the, the slides. Um, this is going to be slightly stretch my I don't know if any of you have used Collaborate, but it's a bit weird to to, uh, to share an application. You have to do stop sharing, which is slightly non-intuitive. Okay, so we've seen that. What I'm going to do is do another, and now I'm going to do a slightly more complicated uh, example called Family 2. Now imagine we have another family called Sally. So I've got my family, Sally's got her family. It would be very wasteful to specific to specify all the rules over and again, to say that, well, Sally's child depends on herself and Sally depends on her parent. That would be like having a make file which for every file had a rule. File 1.0 depends on file 1.c, ucc minus c, file 1.c. File 2.0 depends on file 2.c, cc minus c, file 2.c. I have seen make files written in this format, but it, it's just incredibly tedious and verbose. And actually, it means that make isn't really doing very much for you. So the other nice thing about make is it understands implicit rules. So what I've been given before are explicit rules, but you can do implicit rules based on suffixes. And what you can say is that you can say based on the suffix, and that's the dot child, you can say this is how you create any child. And that rule will apply to David dot child, Sally dot child, Arthur dot child. So I'll now go back to that. I'll, um, it might have been more. Um, efficient for me to share my whole screen, but I've not done that before, so I will carry on the way I know. But now back to the... So I'll go back to family two. And let's just check that I... Okay. So here we have a make file. So this is slightly more complicated. You first of all have to tell make what suffixes you're going to be considering. And here it's dot parent, dot self, dot child. Now you don't always have to do that, but because make understands that dot C and dot F files exist, but, but 
it's safest to do that. So, and I've done it. I've had to do it explicitly here. And then you have an implicit rule, a generic rule, which says that dot. So it's the other way around, a bit weird. This is saying, how do you create a child from yourself? So, so this line dot self dot child implies two things. It says that child files depend on self files, and then on, on the next line, you um, you have to. Um, you have to say how to um, how to update. Now this is where there's a bit of funny magic in in, in um, uh, well funny symbols in Make. But what you have to say is to create a dot child from a dot self, you copy the self to the child. And that strange dollar left bracket means the thing on the uh, left hand side, and dollar at means the thing on the right hand side. So all that strange syntax is saying is if you see a dot self and a dot child. You copy the dot self to the dot child, and the same with the dot parent dot self. It says you copy the dot parent to the dot self. That dollar angle bracket and dollar at are just funny, um, funny, uh, um, yeah, funny rules. Actually, what I should, yeah, they're just just funny symbols which are useful in this context. This also illustrates another thing, which is um, when you type make. Without a type, you just type make. What it does is it creates the first thing in the make file. So by convention, we have a rule at the start, which is just the default rule. So it's conventionally called all. So what this is all this is saying is if I type make, it will try and make all, and all depends on David family and Sally family. And it just says that you know if I type make, I want you to update David family and Sally family. Then I've got the same rules for David family and Sammy, Sally family as I had before, except I've, I've reused this strange dollar at thing just to show that you that you can use it. What that is saying is that David family depends on David child and David self. To update them, you ls minus lrt the David files, and rather than redirecting to explicitly saying David family, I redirected to say dollar at, which means the thing on the the thing you first thought of, which is David family. Um, same for Sally family, and this all illustrates other things. You can have um, the first rule all says uh, if I do make all, I want you to update David family and Sally family, but it doesn't tell you how to update it, so it goes away and looks up how to update those things. So that's a make rule with a first line and not a second line. It says update the first two, and you'll find the rules elsewhere. The final thing clean is the opposite. There is no dependency. So if you do make clean, it is always executed. But what I do is I remove the stuff which I don't want. So this is the classic thing in make files. There's, there's a housekeeping rule for called clean, conventionally called clean, which has no dependencies, which means it's always executed. And, 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 and the thing which is done is to remove all the stuff that's lying around. I remove David family and Sally family, and I remove these annoying twiddle files that Emacs seems to love lying around. So. If I just um, if I just do make, okay, it, they're actually all up to date, so it does nothing. If I do make clean, it removes David family and Sally family and all the rubbish, but there isn't any rubbish lying around. But if I do make again, it will have to recreate David family and Sally family. But I suspect it will notice that all the individual files are in the correct order and just there it just recreates them. However, I can do um, another thing if I if I if I edit David.parent and Sally.parent just to make by here I'm just altering the dates. There's nothing in these files, but I'm just I'm just adding and deleting a space. So now they're up to date. And if I do list list them, you'll see that Sally.parent and David.parent are the most up to date files. And if I type make, it will now create them both. I don't have to do the whole caboodle. I have to update David Parent, David Self, David Self, David Child, recreate David Family, update Sally Parent to Sally Self, Sally Self to Sally Child, and recreate Sally Family. So that's hopefully, if I go back to the presentation, that's hopefully illustrated a few um, um, so it yeah it 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 also uh, it told her explicit implicit, implicit rules based on suffix. This is how you create any child applies to David dot child and Sally dot child. Uh, the third example is the uh, is a real example which I uh, which I distribute uh, with one of our examples of one of our codes. It's a, just a simple image, a simple uh, image processing code to, to to sharpen an image. 
And what illustrates is, is a, this is a real make file. It's a pretty simple one, but it's a real one. It illustrates a number of extra things. It illustrates how you do dependencies on header files, which is, which is standard in C. In C, you have header files, which include kind of global constants, but also include prototypes for functions. So you need to be able to say, look, um, file1.c includes include.h, and therefore file1.c depends on include.h. It shows you how to use um, variables, and these variables are useful to parameterize things. So rather than calling the C compiler GCC, you can give the C compiler a name, C compiler, and then you can change it in one place. So it allows you to do global changes, for example, the compiler or the compiler options by updating a single line. And it also illustrates little tricks for creating one list of variables from another. And I'll come back to that. There are some magic variables. I've actually, we've seen them in the previous example, which are such as the thing on the left-hand side of the expression you're working on, these weird dollar left, uh, left, dollar less than and dollar at. There's a default rule which, will, which tells you how to do the, uh, the, um, the make file. We've, the, 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 um, sorry, it talks about default rules. We've already seen those conventionally all, and we talked about clean. I actually put them in the previous. Um, um, in the previous example. So what I'll do is I'll go back to this just to illustrate. So if I go back to this. So if we look at the make file, there are variables. So MF equals make file just sets a variable called MF, which is equal to the make file. The syntax is similar to shell programming. You've done that. I've set CC equals CC. I've said the C compiler should be called CC. I've got C flags and L flags, which will turn out to be flags to the C compiler and flags to the linker. These are all just variables at the moment. There are conventions that people use, but you don't have to obey them. You can use whatever you want. I said the executor is called sharpen. But the most interesting bit is first, I've now got a variable source, which in the, the backslash is just a continuation character, which says source lists all my source files, sharpen.c, do sharpen.c, filter.c, cio.c, and utilities.c. And inc is a variable which lists all the include files, sharpen.h and utilities.h. And what I've tried to do here is write a make file so that at the top, you just specify what your files are, the basic parameters, and then below, oh, what was it, escape? Font lock mode. Uh, I then tried to say that below that, I've said no need to edit below this line. So let's say what we've done. So first of all, we want to tell, uh, make what suffixes we're going to use for these implicit sort of suffix-based rules. I've said dot suffixes colon says forget everything you knew, and then we're going to do the old dot c and dot o. Um, I'll come back to one of the problems with make is it has an awful lot of implicit rules. What I mean is if you don't tell it what to do, it will guess, and you don't really want it guessing. So dot suffixes says just forget everything you ever thought you knew. In this program, we're only going to be worried about dot c and dot o files. This is the first magic line. I'm going to have to list all the object files because I'm going to have to deal with the object files. But I don't want to have a list of object files which just reproduces this list with .os instead of .cs. That's wasteful. So there's a strange syntax in make which says the object files are the source files, but .c replaced with .o. That's just a slightly strange syntax, but it's very useful. Here's my rule for creating a .o from a .c. It's run the C compiler, which I've parameterized by a variable. The C flags, minus C says just compile the object file. And again, this dollar left-hand side means apply it to the thing. Dollar um, less than means run it on the .c file. My first rule is conventionally called all, and that's all saying if I just type make, it will create the executable. Again, I parameterize the executable as, as this variable x. Just like shell programming, when you define variables, you say x equals sharpen. When you reference them, you put a dollar in the front. So all is depends on, that's just dereferencing the variable. So it's different from um, sort of C and Fortran programming where defining and you do x equals 3 and y equals x. Here you do x equals 3 and y equals dollar x. It's just slightly, slightly different. The executable depends on the object files. 
anytime you change the .o files, you need to create the 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 the, the, dot, the exe. And to create the executable, you um, you link it. You run the C compiler with the C flags. Minus o dollar at is saying call the executable the thing on the left hand side, which is the name the executable, and link the object flags with the link link the object files with the link flags. And the final one is that the object file depends on the, obviously, the include file. So if I change the include file and you read to re recompile, but the object, I've also made sure, made it sure here that the object file depends on the make file itself. $MF was the make file itself. So just to briefly, if I do make clean, this is just real to get rid of everything that removes everything, then I do make, it will create everything. And it creates them. Um, it, it creates the files, and then if I do something like if I e if I edit one of the header files, so I e edit sharpen dot h, I'm just editing it, making it, I'm mean, inserting, and removing a space, and saving it again. If I type make again, it notices that and recreates everything. However, if I only edit one file, if I edit do sharpen dot c, which is just one of the files, if I do an ls now, we see that the most recent file is do sharpen dot c. If I do make, it should recognize that the only file which is changed is do sharpen.c. It should only recompile that and then relink, because do sharpen.o depends on do sharpen.c, and the sharpen executable depends on the .o files, but it only needs to do one compile. And there it did. It only compiled one, one compile and reused the old .os. You might wonder why to put dependency on the make file. Well, imagine I want to change the C compiler from CC to GCC. I now have to recompile everything. And because I've now changed the make file, the make file realizes it's more up to date than anything else and kind of panics and recomp recompiles everything. So having the make file, having the, the, the executable depend on the make file is a way of meaning, say, look, if I've changed the make file, all bets are off. If I've changed the make file, you know, the rules have changed. You just need to remake everything from scratch. And the final thing for, for the housekeeping uh, tasks, uh, you can do things like, I had this clean rule, if I want to create a tar file, which is an archive, like a zip file of all my source files, I just say, well, tar, create uh, sharpen.tar, and what do I stick in it? I put in the make file, the source files, and some other file called fuzzy.pgm. But the make file lists where all your source files are, and this is wrong, okay, so uh, if actually, that's not a deliberate mistake, but if I do make tar, it creates this tape archive, which is just a, like a, a, an archive, but you'll see that it hasn't put in the, the include files. So I actually made a mistake there. So what it should have said was, you want to archive the make file, the source file, and the include files. So I do make tar again. It's now included. You'll see the, the, the header files. So that's you. So, so, so make could be useful not just for building programs, but once you've got a listing of all your source files and everything else, it could be useful for doing housekeeping tasks. One thing which people don't do with make is they don't play around enough. I'll come back to this, but you know, you get handed this make file and it's just magic. You can do you can just print things. So for example, imagine I didn't understand this rule, objects dollar source colon dot c equals dot o. Imagine I didn't understand what that meant, okay? Well I could just put a rule in which said says called print obj, print the object files, print obj. Print obj, which is always executed, which is just, I just echo dollar obj, okay? So echo is just a way, and this is a shell, this is it. So, so the commands that you put in these, in, in make are, are commands which are executed by the shell. They might be, um, Compile commands, there can be anything. Echo is a shell command just to print something. So then I do make print obj, and it says echo, it, it tells me what all the object files are. So that's useful if you, somebody gives you a make file and you don't understand what it's doing. You can put stuff in there to, um, to just print out. The rules don't have to be compiled rules, it could be anything. So that's, that's a very useful debugging tip. The final thing which I think people don't understand is if I do make clean, you don't have, you don't, there is a rule in there to make the executable. I can make anything. So if I want to say, well, I wonder what the, the, the make would do if I wanted to create utilities.o. If I do make utilities.o, it uses the implicit suffix rule of creating.o's from.c's and just creates utilities.o. So you, you don't have to 
You don't have to run make in its entirety. You can just make individual files. So I'll now go back. I don't have time, I think, really. I, there is a... Um, sorry, my knowledge of... Um, Collaborate is slightly failing me here because of having to go between different. So, as I said, that illustrated all these things um, and housekeeping. To find out object files and variable objects, just put in a rule to print it out. There is a Fortran one. It's the same as the C version. I don't want to go through it. It's not particularly any any more different. It's slightly complicated by the existence of, C, of, a, of a single .c file among the .f90s, but it's not, it's not a big deal. It's completely, it's effectively the same as the C one, just with a few renamings. And I'll put these up online, um, hopefully this afternoon, definitely by tomorrow morning. So hopefully, I mean, one of my, my, my bugbears, my issues is that make files get incredibly complicated. And that's sometimes necessary for very complicated codes, but it's often not. So for example, I think it's possible to create relatively simple generic make files, like the ones I've presented here, which just by changing a few lines at the top, which list what your input files are, and what your header files are, what your C compiler is, what the C flags are, um, with a few, uh, that you can then get a, a make file which will compile most standard C codes. And then you can just add a few extra rules for the, for, for the exceptions, but the generic compiling .c files to .o files, compiling .f90 files to .o files, and linking those should be something which is fairly, is fairly generic. So a few things here, dirty linen. Um, tabs have magic significance in make file. Anyone who, the, whoever designed make, it's a wonderful tool, but the, when you have a rule, the line underneath with the executed, you'll see that it was indented, has to start with a tab, not six spaces. So don't cut and paste make files from the web because the cut and paste thing reproduces the tab with the spaces. Whoever thought this was a good idea was clearly, well, clearly it's not a good idea. Uh, luckily, GNU Make warns you about this. I tried it and it says, make, make file 29, missing separator. Did you mean tab instead of eight spaces? Well, given that it knew that I meant tab instead of eight spaces, I don't know why it, it, it insists it's a tab. But that is the number one problem with make files, that tabs have magic significance. So looking at a make file, you can't tell if it's correct or not uh, because you can't see if it's eight, tab, eight spaces or tabs. Uh, you get used to it. But um, Python programmers won't be surprised that indentation is significant, but uh, for a non-Python programmer, it seems slightly strange. Tricks and tips. You can make anything under control of make, e.g. make file.o. Make minor n prints out what make would do without doing it. I'll come back to these. Make minus d prints out why make is doing what it is. I don't find it that useful in practice. It's very verbose. And it's, if you, you can put, your update rules can also print debug info. So, you know, you can put echo. My rule for updating the parent Sorry, the child from the from from the self was copy um, child. Sorry, self to child. But I can also print that out. I'm what I'm doing. I can put updating um, that from that, and that that will print out what it's doing. Again, these are all useful tips for trying to understand what other people's make files are doing. There's nothing to sort you printing things out and such like. Complications. Fortran modules are more sophisticated than C header files. Um, it turns out that to compile a Fortran program in the correctly, you have to co compile the module files um, before you compile the Fortran files. And that makes Fortran make files slightly harder to write. This is because Fortran is more sophisticated than C. In C, if you update uh, a function prototype, the header file has to be updated. But that's the responsibility of the programmer. So uh, to, to manually update the header file. So the ordering, the ordering is still true in C, but in C, it just cheats, well, cops out and says the program has to do one step by him or herself. What if I have hundreds of header files and I can't work out what depends on what? There are tools that make depend, which will look through all your source files and print and effectively generate a make file explicitly. Um, and you can look that up. If you ever use the GNU Auto tools or configure, they just produce make files. That why, that's why you do dot, conf, uh, dot slash configure make make install. Unfortunately, the make files produced by GNU Auto tools are, in my opinion, not human understandable. They are 
verbose in the extreme. So unfortunately, knowing make will not help you understand GNU Auto Tools because in my opinion, the make files it produces are, well, not, not human understandable by me. The final thing, make has a whole host of default rules and variables. I think you should not assume these. So for example, if you do make file.o, if you don't have a rule for file.o, Make will probably guess, well, .o is a created from .c, so I better compile a .c. What compiler should I use? Oh, I'll use GCC. Well, these are just defaults which may vary from system to system. And then if, if you have a, a make file which, which relies on, on the, the, the make defaults, its assumptions, I think it makes it dangerous that that um, make file is not portable. So I, that's why I like dot suffixes colon. It tells make, look, just forget all the rules you thought you know, and let me tell you what, um, what you need to know. So on Archer, what are the issues? Um, we want to make file that works for programming environments, but different compilers have different options. There is an inquiry within the make file. I, the example here, I was going to update this slide, but unfortunately, due to my um, severe audiovisual problems, it took me an hour to get up and running. So what, it, it is possible to inquire from within a make file, what compiler am I using? The reason that's an issue is, if you, if you change the compiler module, it's invisible to make. So if I change the explicit compiler in the make file that updates the data of the make file and make says, oh, I've been updated, I better recompile. But if in your make file on Archer, you, the C compiler is always called CC, the Fortran compiler is always called FTN. You change what it points to by this module switch. But of course, make can't see that. So you have to remember, if ever you do a module switch, you need to make, clean, and make. However, I see a lot of people always doing make, clean, and make. That's only necessary if you have a broken make file. The whole point about make is you shouldn't have to do make clean unless things have really gone wrong. Uh, make should detect all the dependencies. We should always, a correctly written make file will ensure you always recompile all the files which are necessary. So apologies that that uh, took longer than I thought. It was three quarters an hour when I planned for half an hour. Uh, I hope you find it useful. I'm happy to, to take any questions you might have. It's probably easiest if you type them in because audio can be slightly problematic with so many people on the line. But I'm, if you have any questions, please just, just type something in and I should see it. So I see a few people are typing. Um, I haven't seen anything yet, so I don't know if that's... Uh, so D, what problems can I use the minus J flag? Okay, so... Um, the minus, j, so in the first uh, five minutes, I just, so I'll, I'll ask the second question, but in the first five minutes, I just, I just explaining why make was useful. If you have multiple source files, um, you, you have problems that you don't know, you want to make sure when you change one of 100 files, that that file is always recompiled, but only that file is recompiled so that you don't waste time recompiling the other 99. So I'll, I'll maybe, I'll maybe leave, leave up the, the tools slide there. What problems arise when using the minus J? So minus J is parallel make. So this is quite interesting. Because you've told make what files depend on each other, first and foremost, it's looking for dependencies to resolve them. But of course, it can also detect when there are not dependencies between fly, files. And therefore, that allows it to do make in parallel. So if it says, well, um, Fred.o and build.o don't depend on each other at all, I can compile them both simultaneously. So I don't believe, so I'm being naive here, somebody else can maybe comment, but I don't believe there should be any problems if your make file is correctly written. So make minus j4 will say, please do the make, but use four threads. And on a multi-core machine, if you have four processes or more, that should run faster. I don't know if Har I'm sorry, a colleague from Cray is in the room, Harvey, I don't know if he has any has ever any bad experiences with make minus J. Yeah. Ah, okay. It it can make you unpopular because you are hammering the system. And Adrian says it doesn't necessarily handle force on module dependencies correctly. That's true. 
So Andy, I've seen problems with time the four-time modules. So the point is you need to spec up. Okay. So a lot of people resolve the a lot of people don't address the four-time module dependency. What they do is they list things in, 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 in the order they want them compiled. So you'll make sure that when you list your file one, file two, file three, that the modules are contained in file one so they all can be compiled before the other ones. However, if you're doing a parallel make, it will it will compile them all at the same time. So I think it, yeah, so it doesn't necessarily, if you specify the module dependencies explicitly, so the make is aware of them, rather than just relying on the fact you've listed the files in some correct order, then make minus j should be correct. But specifying module dependencies in Fortran is not trivial for two reasons. One is, in C it's explicit, if you hash include um, include 3.h, that is obviously including file include 3.h. In Fortran, if you do use module thread, it's not clear where module thread is defined. It's not necessarily defined in thread.f90. It's more complicated. So you have to explicitly say what it's more complicated. Again, it's a symptom of Fortran being a more sophisticated in terms of its 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 its, its, its structure. But it does uh, mean that a writing make files is hard. A colleague of mine, Stephen Booth, wrote a very nice tool which looked at your Fortran files and, and wrote the module dependency rules automatically so you could cut and paste them into your make file. It might be worth resurrecting that. It can be very complicated when you have modules dependent on modules. Yes, that's true. So I think Stephen's tool copes with that. There's a rule in modules you can't have circular references and um, I, I think I should go and speak to Stephen. He called it I can't remember, it was a very nice tool that I would find very useful. The other problem in Fortran is Fortran doesn't specify how the modules are stored. So some compilers create a .mod file, some compilers stick the information in the um, .o file. So that can make, uh, that can mean that writing a correct make file is slightly different. Um, but yes, it can become very complicated. So a tool which did it a tool which did it for you would be useful and, and a colleague, Stephen Booth, wrote one and I will try and um, maybe resurrect it. How does make the compiler IP optimizations? Um, so Andy Turner, so I think the compiler, opt compiler IP optimizations are inter procedural analysis into program Basically, it, it, it's things where it, um, okay, Fort Dep, okay, but that, that's not the tool that Stephen wrote. Stephen wrote a Yak and Lex based tool. Um, there is a tool, okay, we should, I can look into Fort Dep. Um, I should, we should take a note of that and maybe come up with some examples. So IP optimization allows the compiler to, for example, inline code. And my understanding of the way IPA works on at least some compilers is that when you compile a code, it doesn't actually compile it. It actually does the compile at the link stage. So in that sense, the compile is a dummy step. And in fact, you're kind of just doing cc star dot c at the end. It's sort of basically, it just takes all the, it looks at all the files at once. And to do that, it it it, it um, postpones it to the link stage when you're doing when you're linking all the files. And at that point, it resolves them all. So that's my understanding of how it works, and for example, why it ought to work with make minus j, because the final link stage is 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 done on one thread, and that should sort them all out. I don't know if that's true in the Cray compilers. Yeah, so Harvey's pointed out that, again, for whole program optimizations, that is going to be difficult. That's a good question. I don't, so my naive answer would be IPA delays the actual compilations or delays the IPA part on the link stage. But it may be more complicated than that. Um, maybe need to speak to a compiler person. That's a, that's a, Well, IPA optimizations would possibly, would, would in a C file, in a C program, if you wanted to do not, if, if you called a function thread, 
you would need to have compiled the, the I would have thought IPA um, I would have thought yeah yeah we, I believe I, we don't quite know how it does it but we believe it will always work cat minus t will show tabs of the i okay fine so that that's that's a useful tip so Fatima make compare the date stamps of files but no ownership of files I think is, is that so is that a question or do you think that's a problem So I wonder, are you saying we've had a problem that that, that Make does that, or, or are, you, are you asking? Okay, yes. Yeah, so it doesn't. So by default, it just looks at the date stamps. You, if you wanted to look at the ownership, you'd have to put in your own little Unixness. Um, is that a problem? Um, I mean, it could be a problem that what, if you don't own a file and it tries to compile it, it might complain. It might just say, you know, you do cc file.c and file.c belongs to somebody else. Then it will, that might fail. But that, in practice, that's not normally a problem. In practice, you, you download all the source files, unpack them yourself. So you're right, make does, uh, make does compare the date stamps of files, not the ownership. But I don't, think, I don't think that's a problem in practice unless I've, unless I've missed something. Okay. Yeah, so Andy said the actual um, ownership is controlled by Unix permissions. Um, yeah, if you can read it, I was just worried that you might be in a different directory. So, but you're right, sorry, about Andy's right, that if you can read a file, uh, when you compile it, the .o file will, will belong to you, regardless of who the initial file. Yeah, okay, so actually, even if the ownerships come out a bit funny, um, you should be okay. Normally, when you un like it, when you unpack a tar file, at least in Unix, the ownership is always it, it belongs to you. It doesn't doesn't remember the initial ownership. Okay, so that's Andy saying, yeah, yeah, that's a problem. Well, it's not a problem, but you won't be able to edit the file, so it. Uh, Make will compile it the first time it finds it, and then if for a correct make file, will never compile it again. So, as I said, this session should have been recorded because I did. Um, let's just check that I am recording it. I am recording it. Um, I'm happy to stay for a bit. If anyone has any more questions, I will put on this. The slides will go online, but also I'll somewhere I'll put up the the um, the files which I use for the demonstration because I find it to be honest, I find it very useful writing this talk because I there were a few things in make which I didn't understand. For example, if you don't tell make my dot parent dot child sorry, dot parent dot self rule was ignored by make unless I explicitly told it at the top that I was going to be using those as suffixes, which was strange to me because I would have thought it was implicit that given given, given I get a given a rule for how to create myself from my parent, it would have assumed that there were suffixes it should look up, but that's not true. Um, that's because I'd never written a make file before which used weird suffixes. I'd always used dot c dot f which it knows about. So that was one thing which was useful to me. Um, just while I'm here, I guess most people have left, but if, just to show why I don't think make minus D is useful is if I go to um, if I go to family one, which is just the, the simplest make file you could ever imagine, fam, um, cat make file. You've seen it, it's a tiny little make file. If I, for example, update the parent, which was the thing which means it needs to, um, if I do make minus uh, D, for this trivial case, it produces four or five pages of output. 
unbelievable. How much output is that? That's insane. I mean, I mean that. Yeah, yeah. This is more than I. How many lines is that? Yeah, it's almost a thousand. Two, over seven hundred fifty lines of output for a, you know a, a two real make file. So make minus d is um, uh, yeah, make minus d gives you all the gory detail, but unfortunately it doesn't tell you anything. It tells you more so much that you. If I had said updating somewhere in there. There, there. Prereqs that David dot self is newer than David target David dot child must remake target David dot child. So, so there's a couple of lines in there which are useful, but um, maybe if I pipe. Put into in any anything with David in it. Maybe that would give me something useful. No, no, because it no, it doesn't didn't work. Anyway. So I hope people find that useful. Um, as I said, the recording will be online. The source files will be online. Again, apologies that they weren't. The source files weren't online in advance, but that was uh, make minus minus debug equals flags. Let's you different rules. I don't understand. Can you give me an example which would? Oh, okay. Make minus. Make David family minus debug. If you did B there, David Raven, A equals B, that should give you less stuff. Okay, ah, there we are. Thanks. You learn something every day. That's brilliant. Thank you, Andy. I'll put that in the I'll put that in the talk. Um, this is useful. David Opress do must copy right, successfully remade. And that okay, that's exactly the output I wanted. Perfect. Thank you. That's really useful. That's really useful. I'll put that in the talk. That's great. I think there's one other thing you suggested, Adrian, that I think there are two other things. There was cat minus T. Could you make a quick list of, of these three things, Adrian? Sorry about that. Uh, to... I will do. Cat minus T, the fort, fort, fort depend. depend or something, and your make minus D trick. So that would yeah. be good. Okay, if there's no one else, I shall. Uh, thanks for attending, and um, there'll be another virtual tour in a month. I haven't quite decided the topic yet, but it'll be. Um, I'll try and decide it more in advance than this one. It'll hopefully be. A, oh, okay, SB one question. Yep, sure. It's quite weird because I don't know who these people are. No, it's, oh, I'll pull it. Sorry. So yes, you can ask any question you want about Arch. Sorry, so it's not restricted to, to, to make or anything. If you have any general question, feel free to ask them. Right. Uh, my lab makes an I'm going to see well, my mouse well, I'm going to get a response from one process. So. I hate process, but it's quick. I'm using always says even though. So I think. I'm not a MATLAB programmer, but I think in MATLAB, if you want to do things in parallel, you have to use inbuilt parallel. Um, MATLAB has an extended syntax for parallelism, so you can do a for loop, but you can also do a parallel for loop. So I think I think to utilize it has a shared memory model, and there. I think that, I think it has like a parallel four or a shared four. It has multiple, it's called um, four par, I think four par. But you you should you should also be able to open MP with MATLAB, depending on what version of MATLAB you have. The more expensive MATLAB, I think, also lets you write open MP code. But David's right; it does have a, an inbuilt four par. I think it's called, which does parallel. Oh, that's so. Parallel. So, so it says here I tried a par four on that. Well, yeah, so, so it does have two parallel models. One is it's a shared memory model akin to OpenMP, and the other is um, another is a distributed memory model where it effectively copies things in a kind of task farm way. The problem there is you need to run more than one copy of MATLAB, so you need more than one license. So one is using multiple threads within a single instance of MATLAB. Another is Tying together multiple instances of MATLAB, but the par four. So 
so I don't know who was it SB that said the I tried a par four. Yeah, so that's my understanding is that par four is effectively a a sort of open MP like um, model within MATLAB, and that should work. Again, you will have to understand a bit to write correct programs and get speed up. You'd have to understand a bit more about how the shared memory model worked. But I think. I think that's. We did do a report on this. A couple of people worked on it maybe three or four years ago. Eleanor and George did various things on it, and there was a technical report. Um, we tried various, um, took a couple of standard programs. I can't remember what. I'm guessing with stuff like Mandelbrot set and other bits and pieces, and, and tried them in these different parallel models. So, so. Uh, um, okay, so someone's put the URL up there. It's maybe I haven't. Uh, um, sorry, I'm having trouble. So this link. Uh, So this is the link here. Uh, so what does it say? Very small font. Okay, I don't really understand this because I'm not. I, I'm just going to skim read it. But it looks like that there's. Okay, so this is including. The, the, okay, this is this this is alluding to what um, Adrian said that you can actually, if you have the the correct version of uh, MATLAB, and I don't know which one that is, you can actually write OpenMP within um, within MATLAB. So there are at least two parallel models, shared memory parallel models in MATLAB. One is the PAR4 construct, the other is to write. Uh, uh, Stuff explicitly. Yeah, that might be that might be useful. I don't know if that helps. Um, so it's not working. Um, I mean, a, an interesting question would be: do, do you know what? How do you know it's not working? Do, does it print out how many threads it's running on, or is it just not running any faster? Okay, so someone's pointing out here: you do need to enable OpenMP in the um, in the compile stage because just because you've enabled OpenMP, just because you've written OpenMP in your code doesn't mean it's interpreted. So some on the, on Archer, OpenMP is is, is um, parsed by default, but on most systems, you have to explicitly say um, um, interpret the OpenMP um, flags, and if you don't, you will just get a serial code. So that's that's a good suggestion. That's that's another problem. That's another potential thing. You have to enable. Um, OpenMP in MATLAB, you have to enable OpenMP in the compiler. Okay, so I think it's drawing to a close. Um, configure and make files. So is that a so, sorry, do you, do you have a specific question from Fatima? I think I was just saying you have to put the minus F open MP flag in both places. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Took 
uh, I didn't quite. Well, configure should produce the make file, so if you specify to configure, it should have been. So okay, okay, so the original comment from D was I said CXX flags for cloud minus F and P. I guess that's assuming using configure and CXX flags as standard. You, you may have to put it in the if you are using configure and uh, the other tools, you have both configure.in and makefile.in as well. Depends what version you're using. Uh, so there may be places where you have to put it in twice, but okay. depends how it's set up. Specifying it in more than one place isn't a bad thing to do. But um yeah. Okay, so I hope that was useful to people. I'll draw this session to a close. Thanks for attending. And as I said, I'll put the material up online um, as soon as possible. Thanks, everyone.